to do some things. And last week's message, I thought, well, right beside last week's message, I seen it. Boy, I know what God's up to. How many of you ever thought, I know what God's up to when you're praying about something and you see little things fall and then all of a sudden it goes and that wasn't in the plan. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I thought I knew what the message was and I tried six ways from Sunday to put it together and it just would not come out. The thing of it is, we think we know what God's doing, but we really don't. God knows what's best. God knows what needs to be said, when it needs to be said, and how it needs to be said. And I was sitting there, and I, you can ask my wife. I said, Lord, I get really frustrated. really frustrated. And she'll tell you I was. I mean, I wasn't mad. I wasn't throwing things. I was just getting frustrated. Because I wasn't getting the message that I thought she'd get. So one night, I sat down at the table, and Jane was sitting there, and I just flipped my Bible over. When I read the first two verses, it was just it lit up. I knew it was right. So sometimes we can think we know what God's doing, but God has another plan. So don't get discouraged. When you pray, let God do it His way because He knows what's best. That's why we pray. We pray for this and, and this is our request, but your will be done. That's because he knows what's best for us. And when I was going through this, I started to understand how many of you have been praying? You know, we've been talking a lot about patience. We've been talking a lot about knowledge and growing in Christ and becoming the likeness of Christ like we should have as Christians. How many of you have been praying about that? Lord, I want to be like Christ. I want the world to see me that I am like Christ. Not people can. I mean I am Christ-like in His nature. I'm loving, I'm kind, I'm patient. Whoa. Because in about the first two or three verses of this, this smacked me like a sledgehammer. This is what you asked me for. This is what you asked me to do. And without tribulations and trials, where's your patience? Yeah. So with that being said, we'll get into the message. And I hope it blesses you as much as it's blessed me. I'm in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, we'll start at verse 1. That's spelled R-O-M-A-N-S. Oh, you got to do that, Eddie. You got to laugh at me. What page? Well, in my Bible, it's 1,227. So that probably gets you close, sister. <laughs> Are you there? one. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and we rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. The biblical term for hope is that we have a confident expectation expectation everybody hear me? But this is a different type of expectation than what I was expecting. 
of what God has promised us. We have an expectation of what God has promised us in His Word. Not that I'm going to get, have an expectation that I'm going to get the message that I want to preach. There's a difference. God made these promises in His Word, and we are to stand on those promises. And it is also our strength that He is faithful. See, hope, the Bible gives us hope in it, or God gives us word, and He gives us hope. See, I'm already off there. That's all right. He gives us hope in His word and in His promises. We are to expect good things from God. God never gives us any junk. He gives us hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we have that hope, with that hope comes joy. The Bible says that joy should be unspeakable. How many of you have unspeakable joy in your life today? Amen, sister. How many know that nothing, nothing you do will stop God from loving you? That is our hope. When you put your faith and hope in God, then all things are possible to you. I'll try to stay up here. Right? Then he goes on, he says, And not only so, but we have the glory of tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. There's that word patience. And in order to get patience, we have to go through some things. And that's one of the things that I prayed about, was to be more patient in all situations that I might encounter. Well, if I'm going to be patient, God's just not going to hook me out a big bunch of patience and throw on top of me. I'm going to be put into those things that are going to cause me to use my patience. And I live with one of them. I <laughs> but when you ask God to do certain things, don't expect a certain outcome. Because he knows what's best for you. If we want to become Christ-like, those tribulations and those things that we went through and go through and all those things that he's brought us through in the past teaches us patience. Okay, verse 4. And patience, experience, and experience is hope. Okay, God gives us patience through all the experiences He's brought us through. How many ever been through some really bad things and watched God bring you through those and bring you out on the other side? What does that do for you? It gives you more hope in God. It gives you more hope that He will never ever leave you and He will never ever forsake you. It gives you a hope which hope should bring joy abundantly knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. He is the rock of your foundation and He will never leave you and He will never forsake you. But don't let me go through bad times. What did the Lord Jesus Christ go through? See, this is what I wanted to preach. I wanted to preach the cross and I wanted to take communion. But God said no. God said no. This is what I want you to preach. And I've told you and told you before, you can't all willy-nilly get in there and preach what you want to preach. You have to preach what the Holy Spirit leads you to preach because the Holy Spirit is the one that knows what's going on and knows what needs to be said and knows what's in your heart and your heart and my heart and knows how to deal with it. This should give us hope because it shows us not only hope, but it shows us that He is in total, 100% control of our lives. Which should give us joy abound. Joy should abound in our lives because of what Christ's done for us. That's what it all lays on. It lays on the foundation that the Lord Jesus Christ gave up His life for us and that is where our hope's at. Amen? Experience gives you hope 
to know and to see that God brought me through that. The Jewish people were horrible at this. They always had to have a sign that God was with them, that God would not leave them. And God told them himself, I brought you through all that. Look back. Look, see what I brought you through. See what I brought you to. And you still won't listen to me. God knows what He is doing. He is the God of all hope. He is the God of all hope. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Hallelujah! When we become Christians, God planted the Holy Ghost in our bodies, and we have hope. We have now a guidance. We have someone to guide us, someone to lead us and teach us and bring us into all truths of God's Word. That should give you even more joy because you know you're not alone. That little voice in there says, don't do that. That'll get you in trouble. You need to learn to heed that voice and listen to that voice. And that's something that I wasn't doing because I had it in my head that this was the way God was going. And God said, no, no, no. I'm going this way. You're the one going that way. You need to follow me. See, he's still teaching me the same way he's teaching you. The same way when they were writing this, they were preaching it all at the same time. Imagine how hard that was. It took me six days to get it through my head that the cross was not what God wanted me to preach. But I had it in my head and my heart that that's the way it was going to go. And like I said, I tried six ways from Sunday to make it work, and it would not work. I could not put it together. It just would not happen. Why would it not happen? Because my Heavenly Father, leading me by the Holy Spirit, knew that that wasn't what needed to be said. There was something else that needed to be said, and it was this word of hope. We have hope in Christ. We have so much hope in God. All the things He's taken us through. Look back on that. Look back when I was laying in that hospital for two straight months with my back broke and all busted up, my kidneys busted, and all those things that God brought me through. And he said, no, no, that's not going to take you out because I have a plan and a purpose for your life. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. He loves you. He wants the best for you. We're the ones that mess it up because we don't listen. But we have hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to go to Ephesians 1 and 13. You can turn there with me if you want. You don't have to. And this is the way it sums it up. In whom you also have trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We were sealed with the Holy Spirit. There is nothing that can take you away, take that away from you. God put his seal, his stamp on you. He put his stamp of approval on you because you accepted his son and the blood that he shed for your sins. He stamped you. That's mine. That's hope. That is hope. That should make us so happy that no matter what happens here on this earth, this earth is temporal and that is not going to last. And our hope is in heaven with the very one that stamped that seal of approval on us because of what Jesus done on the cross. Amen? Amen. Amen. Andy, 
I love that. I love that. You are sealed by God. You are approved by God. Not by works, but by your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So tell me why we can't go through the day and be happy and sing praises to God when we know that. When we get on to this a little bit more, I'm going to have you so excited you ain't going to be able to sit still in your seats. <laughs> I'm going to try. Okay, let me get back to where I was at. What was I preaching at? Okay, Romans chapter 5. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So before you and I ever came to be, the Bible tells us that Christ was there before the foundations of the earth were ever created. And he was there for the simple purpose of being there for you and me and to make himself a sacrifice that would be pleasing to God that he could save me and you. What an awesome deal that is. What an awesome deal that is. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. What's that mean? Are you going to run out and die for somebody today? You don't want to, do you? That's what it's talking about. For scarcely... For a righteous man, one will die. Yet, peradventure, for a good man, some will even dare to die. Think about that. But God commendeth his love towards us. It's what? His love. He loves you and me, brothers and sisters, and that should make you so happy that you can't contain it. It's an awesome thing. And we let these little piddly things down here on planet Earth destroy our lives and cause us to do stupid stuff, throw things, when we all should be thinking about how much God loves us, what He's done for us, what He's taken us through. And that should give us the joy and the hope of having we don't even begin to know. We was talking about this in Bible study. When Paul was took into the third heavens, he come back and he was so, for lack of a better way to put it, he couldn't even put it into words. He couldn't even explain what it looked like. It just was, he was in awe and it just blew his mind. And that's for you and me. Somebody say, hallelujah. That is an awesome thing to put in your heart. To know. No matter what happens in the year, look what I've got to do. He is an awesome God. He is an awesome God. But God commendeth his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Before you and I were ever born, Jesus went to the cross and gave up his life for you and me. See, this message really is about the cross. This message that what Jesus has done on the cross for you and me, it is about the cross. It's all about the cross. But see, God was doing a work in me. God was teaching me something. And I learned two things. Be patient. Wait on the Lord. He is faithful. Because when he gave me this message, by the time I got done with it, I understood. 
See, so don't get all, don't get so hyped up in knowing what you think God wants you. Let God lead you. Let God have your life. Let God have his way with you. And I was, I'm flesh. Me and Ralph talk about this all the time in Bible study. Until this stuff right here is gone, we're going to be messed up. We're going to do things we shouldn't do. We're going to do things wrong. We have the hope that Jesus died for those mess ups. He died for those sins for you and me. And until we get to that home of glory, we ain't going to be perfect, but we should become as Christ-like as possible because that's what that dark and dying world out there needs to see. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are His eyes, His hands, His feet being led in the Holy Spirit to do His will, not our will. See, the whole time that Jesus walked on this earth, how many times did he say to him, over and over and over and over and over, I'm not about this or that. I'm about the Father's will. Because he knows how important your soul is. And once you give your life to him, let him have it. Don't wrestle with it. Don't think you know what's best and then go ask God what's best and then go do what you want to do. And that's exactly what I basically did. I thought I knew what the message was supposed to be, but I didn't. So God said, right now is a good time to teach you a little bit of patience. I ain't going to give it to you yet. And I was threatened. You know what I got? Yesterday about 2 o'clock. And I said, Lord, I've got to preach this message. You've got to do something. This ain't working. I've read here, I've read here, I've read here, I've read here, I've read here. It ain't working. That's because he didn't want it to work. He was teaching me some patience. And he was teaching me one more time, one more time, and one more time that he is faithful. I mess up, but he doesn't. When we realize that and just let him have our lives the way we ought to, your life will be so much better. You will live a blessed life. But with our flesh, we don't always want to do that. And we'll get into that here in a minute. Much more than, verse 9, much more than being now justified by the blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. He came, he shed his blood on the cross to justify you and me. Our justification is in what the Lord Jesus Christ done on that cross. He spilled his blood for the remission of our sins because he loved us. He knew he was the only one, the only one that could keep the law perfect. He knew he was the only one that could please the Father. That's why he was so diligent in his work. I'm not about to serve. I don't live here. But I've come to save those in the earth. Because they have a soul. And I want them to live with me forever. In heaven. In the kingdom of God. What, jo what joy and what hope. What peace that should bring to our lives. You know, sometimes... Like we talked last week, God don't just show up until you take the first step. Till you step out in the deeper water, you can't swim. 
But instead of giving up, I will give myself a little bit of credit. Instead of giving up, I kept plugging into it. I kept praying. I didn't give up. But I did get frustrated. And I'll be the first to admit that. But I kept telling myself, God is faithful. And sure enough, He is faithful. And when I've seen it, I don't know how to describe it. When you read what he wants you to do, it just explodes. And you just know it. And I tried and tried and tried and tried to put the message of the cross together. And I've done it before. But it just wouldn't work. It's because he didn't. Let's go on. For it, when we were enemies, we were what to God? We were enemies of God. We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Hallelujah. Did you hear that? We are saved, sealed, sanctified, justified, all that because of what the Lord Jesus Christ done on that cross. And I don't know what keeps you from jumping and shouting and glorifying God because Christ done it all for you. It didn't cost you nothing. But it cost Him everything. And all He asked for is your life. He wants you to follow Him. He wants you and I to become like Him. And you know all these messages in the past few weeks have been dealing with this right here. To become Christ-like. To become more patient, more loving, more kind, more long-suffering, more faithful to your spouse or your friends or your church or whoever. To be like Christ. That is our ultimate goal. That's what we should be striving for. Is to be like Him. He loves us. He loves us. Before we were ever thought of, He was there for us because of His love. Before Mommy and Daddy ever gave you and I a thought, He already And he was willing to give up his life for you and me and suffer that penalty and that pain. And not only so, but we also, what? Joy in God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we atonement for sin. See, He is our joy. He is our peace. He is everything in our lives to us. And He called Himself what? The great I Am. And He am whatever you and I need Him to be to get you from point A to point B. To take you through this life. To make an example out of you to the world. To make you Christ-like, that you might draw others to you, the same way Jesus did. All the things that Christ done while He was on this earth was for a purpose of drawing people to Him. And that's what you and I need to practice. The more Christ-like we become, who wants to be around an old grumpy grouch? Who wants to be around somebody that's happy and fun and acts like Christ? We all do. Did you ever see our previous pastor ever without the love, the love of Christ in his heart? He was a really good, he wasn't a perfect man, but he loved with a love that many need. He loved with a love that many needed. 
If that's what you and I are supposed to strive for. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom, by whom we now have received atonement. Let's look at Galatians 4. That's in the Go Eat Popcorn section. Galatians, Ephesians. Come on. Verse 9. Right there. It says this. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, or until ye desire again to be a Once you know Christ, you don't have to go back to that old man. You don't have to go back to those chains of bondage, to those old sins, to those old ways of life, to those old friends that dragged you down, to those old friends that wasn't good for you, to the alcohol, to the bottle, to the needle, to the drug addictions. You don't have to go back to that because you have better in Christ Jesus. You don't have to be wrapped up in bondage anymore. You don't have to be shackled down with chains. Because the Lord Jesus Christ gives us liberty. He gives us freedom. Are we supposed to sin? God forbids it. But if we do sin and mess up, God forgives it. He sheds His grace abundantly upon our sins. There is no sin too great that God cannot forgive it. Because where sin abounds, His grace much more abounds. And I know that I can say, thank God for that. Thank God for that. Because I've done some unspeakables. And I thank God for that. Think about that. Where sin abounds, that don't mean you just go live any willy-nilly life you want to. That means you're striving to be like Christ. But you're still in this flesh. And you're going to mess up from time to time. I don't care how hard you try not to sin. You're going to mess up. But that's what, the, that's what Paul was talking about. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Meaning, I can still forgive you. No matter how great the sin, I can still forgive you. There's one sin that you cannot be forgiven of. And that's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's just totally walking away from God. I want no part of you. This Jesus life is not for me. I do not want you in my life. Totally unforgivable. Now I'm not talking about you going through a rough spot. And I talked about this last week. I'm not talking about you going through a rough spot and stumbling and falling and maybe not praying as hard. That's not what that's talking about. It's talking about totally eliminating God from your life. That's the only thing that God cannot forgive you for. All the rest of it, all you have to do is go with a contrite heart and say, Lord, I messed this up. Give me one more chance. How many one more chances has God gave you in your life? He's gave me hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I probably can't count. Because when you ask God for one more chance, He don't even remember what you've done. Because He said He would throw your sin as far as the east is from the west. He don't have a clue what you've even done. He said, I won't remember it anymore. That's why it's so important not to let that catch you up in bondage and hang on to that sin. Let God have it, forget it, and start one more new step in the right direction. Don't hang on to that stuff. And so many people do. So many church people do. But that's not what God wants us to do. How can you have joy in your life when you're hanging on to the sin that you committed yesterday that God's forgot all about? How can that bring you any type of joy? How can that bring you any type of happiness? We're supposed to be a happy people because of what Christ done for us on the cross. We're supposed to be happy. We're supposed to be that light.
It's shining on the hill. There's help. There's hope. There's the light. I can go to that light. I know I can get help. I can get the spiritual feedings that I need there. That will help me get through this. God loves us so much. And every way you try to go, He'll be there with you. It might not be the right way, but He'll get you back on track. He loves us, church. That's why it's so important, so important to be like Christ. That's our goal. Because He gave it all for you and me. Okay, verse 12. Wherefore, by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even over them that had not sinned. After the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. That word similitude means a similarity. See, when, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they sinned against God. And they, they were told, if you do this and you eat from that tree, you'll surely die. But Satan showed up and said, you won't surely die. You'll be more like God. You'll know. But what happened? They died. Now what's that talking about? Those that haven't even sinned. Those that really didn't even sin. They're still in sin. Because when they took that bite, and they disobeyed God. They sinned against God. They brought sin into the world. Adam and Eve had dominion over the earth and all the animals. But when they disobeyed God, Satan took that away from them. That's why the Bible calls him, he is the God of this world. See, one man brought sin into the world. And there was one man that took sin out of the world, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ that got up on that cross, and he died for you and me, and he shed and spilled his blood because he loved us so much. One flesh brought sin in, and one flesh took sin out, and it's always going to be those that are in Christ Jesus. There is no sin. There is none. Jesus took it on the cross. So don't beat yourself up over it. I'm not telling you it's okay to sin because it's not. But I am telling you if you mess up, that the Lord Jesus Christ will forgive you of that sin. Forget it. Get it forgiven. Get it under the blood and move on. Be happy. Be joyful. Be thankful. Be as Christ-like as we can be. We're not going to be perfect. For so many years, I tried that perfect life. It ain't there. The only perfection that is in me is what the Lord Jesus Christ did on that cross because that's what God looks at. When I mess up, that is where God is at. And He doesn't see me. He sees the blood that I've covered my body in and my soul. And He says, that is my job. And I don't see no sin because Jesus said, I'll make intercession for you and he has to be forgiven and God says forgive him. It's over. It's done. Now let's move on. See, this really is about the cross. This whole book is about the cross. What a powerful work God was showing me. You think you got it right, Rick, but you don't. It's really 
Because that's what this whole book is about. From Genesis to Revelation. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ coming to that cross, willing to die, willing to be on this earth, willing to suffer the pain. We suffer a little while and it is counted. We're supposed to glorify in that. Our sufferings are nothing compared to what He has got for us in heaven. The Bible plainly makes that clear. It's all about Him. It ain't about me. It ain't about you. It's about what He is doing through us. That's what it's about. All of one play on that. Okay. Verse 15. But not as the offense. It is a free gift. For if through the offense one man, many dead, but much more than grace, more and more grace of God. You hear that? Through one man's sin, many die. But through the more and more grace of God. See, sin abounded there, but God's grace was so much greater. It abounded greater than the sin. And it always will. It will never, ever, ever not cover your sin. God's grace will cover your sin no matter what. <clears throat> the gift by grace by which by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. One man caused many to die and one man caused many to be saved. The Lord Jesus Christ is our hope. The cross is this whole book. So don't let Jesus out of your sight. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift for the judgment was by one to condemnation. But, I love when God says but, because when He says but, something good is about to be said. But, the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. You are justified by what Christ Jesus has done on that cross. Amen. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Much more, they which receive abundance. Hear that? Hear that? Listen to this. By one much more, which received abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign and by one Lord Jesus Christ. It's about His righteousness. Just like I just said there a minute ago. It's not, God don't see me when I goof up or when I goof up. God sees Christ on you. He knows we're flesh. He knows we can be a bunch of goobers. But He knows Christ was perfect. He knows Christ was perfect. Christ came to fulfill the law. He was the only one that could do it. And we came from the law to grace. Where would you and I be if we didn't have grace? We'd be in a rough spot. But by His grace, that brings us joy, peace, love, kindness, long-suffering, Patience. Because we know we can practice those things because we know He is in total control. Amen. Now most people out there, if you say God's in total control, well, He ain't controlling a lot of us. Well, He's not, really, because He gave us free will. 
He wants the ones that love him willingly. But what they don't understand out there is they are still under God's grace. Because if it wasn't for God's grace, they wouldn't be even living. They would be out of here. But God is so long-suffering and kind and merciful. The worse the sin, the more grace of When you get caught up in that sin, it puts you in bondage. It takes away your joy, your peace, your love. Therefore, as an offense of one judgment come upon all men to condemnation. See, when Adam sinned and Eve sinned, you were condemned. You were born into a life of sin. Whether you ever committed a sin or not, as soon as that baby pops out of that womb, it is a sin. Because it was born into that. Even so, by the righteousness of the one free gift. You notice how many times it said free gift? Came upon all men unto justification of the Lord. You see, everything Christ did, He's justified you and me. As soon as you accept Him, God puts His stamp sealed to that day of redemption. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Adam messed it up. Eve messed it up. But Christ made it right. Jesus made it right. Praise God. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Did you hear that? Moreover, the law entered that offense might abound. But, here's that word but again. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Your sins are covered. They're forgiven. Be happy. Be full of joy. Be full of peace. And I'll just go on here and read the last verse. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I'll read you this. It's the verse or chapter six, verse one. Paul writes, What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Verse two says this. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer? See, church, God's grace will cover your sin. But the Bible says those that sin willingly, to them it is sin. It's one thing to sin willingly. It's another thing to smash your thumb with a hammer and say a bad word before you even got a chance to think about it because it hurts you. God's grace, God's love, and God's mercy should make us the happiest people that's alive on the face of this earth today. 
And yet, a lot of times, most of us walk around in defeat. Because we won't grab a hold of that. <coughs> I'm going to read you a couple more verses. I'm going to close it out. In Isaiah... Isaiah 53. I'm going to start with verse 9. Y'all there? <coughs> you just want me to read it? <coughs> it said, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the bridge, with his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. This is talking about Jesus. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and he shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteousness servant justify many, for he shall bear your iniquities. Your iniquities is basically. Jesus went to the cross for one reason, and that was because he loved you and me. He loved you and me before you and me were ever thought about being you and me. I just want us to take some time this week and look at your life. Look at where you think you're messed up, where do you think you should be, or why you're not happy. And just think on these things. Just think on these things. The hope and all the blessings that we have because of what Christ does in the cross. I know this message has certainly lifted me up. And I needed it. See, that's another thing. God knows what we need and when we need it. But I was so ingrained in my mind and in my heart that this message was supposed to be about the cross. Was it about the cross? Yeah, it was. It just wasn't the cross. says this, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Nothing can take you out of God's hand. Absolutely nothing. No sin, no nothing can pluck you out of God's hand. Nothing can give to take away the love that He has for you. Because He is faithful. He loves us. And He will never, ever leave you hanging.
out on them. You might think you are, but when the time is right, God will say, hey, 